Sheikh Imran Hossein, in the past you have referred to the possibility of civil war in Turkey. And I ask you, what is happening there now? Uh, Maurice, I'm very happy that you have, uh, you have started this uh, interview with this particular question. Because I think this is number one item on the agenda when we look at the events uh, over the last week or two weeks in Turkey. Uh, I do not describe it as an insurrection. I do not describe it as an uh, uprising as yet. I think it's still an unrest uh, because it is largely confined to the political opposition to the present government. I don't know whether there's evidence to suggest that it is beyond the political opposition. I sense that the government still has its power base intact. Uh, in which case, if my analysis is correct, you have the beginnings, the structure being established now for civil law. Meaning two parties, two sides which are unyielding. Neither side being able to draft the other into its, its embrace. Um, I have been anticipating Turkish civil war for the longest while, saying that as soon as Turkey strikes out against Syria, which I believe is only a matter of time, that it is going to provoke a response in Turkey, uh, which I anticipate to be civil war. Um, what is interesting about the present unrest is that it bears a remarkable similarity to other color revolutions in different parts of the world and to what has recently occurred in what is called the Arab Spring. The new technology uh, in the internet something called social media, something called Twitter that I never came across. I don't know Twitter. I've never met her or met her. Met her. Um, I'm not familiar with her. Twitter. Uh, but they say there's something called Twitter, and it's a very powerful tool in the social media. Uh, there's something called SMS. Uh, uh, there are also text messages. Now, Maurice, if you send me a text message, you read five, you'll wait 5,000 years for a reply because I don't know how to send a text message. Be that as it may, uh, we see these new gadgets of information technology being applied in a very crafty, very crafty way. Uh, that once, once a protest has emerged in a particular country, that it can be exploited through the social media to expand until it becomes a universal conflagration in that country. This is what happened in Tunisia. This is what happened in Egypt. And now this is precisely what is happening in Turkey. The the internet and the information technology that we have is not coming us to us from China. It's not coming to us from Russia. It's not coming to us from India. It is coming to us from that Judeo-Christian alliance which has given to the world modern Western civilization. And so, and so therefore, it seems to me to be a tool being used by the Zionists to achieve their objectives. And I sense it being at work in Turkey as well. The question which arises is, what is the objective of the external forces at work, not the internal? Insofar as the internal forces at work in Turkey are concerned, I perceive two camps, both unyielding, and therefore the ingredients for civil war. This is my reading. But I don't think that civil war is going to come just as yet. So what could be the agenda 
of external forces at work using modern technology to keep the fires burning. Do they have as part of the agenda regime change, removing Erdogan and putting someone in his place who might be able to dance better to their tunes? I don't think so. I believe they've invested too much for too long in Turkey to risk losing what they've invested in such a venture in replacing Erdogan with someone else. And so I am sensing, Maris, I am sensing that they are perhaps putting pressure on Erdogan that perhaps the only way out for him in this crisis that he is facing from his political opposition is to create a diversion, an escape route. And the only diversion that readily comes to mind is what has been pre-planned and scripted for him long ago by NATO, and that is a Turkish invasion of Syria. And so I'll not be surprised, Morris, if as the unrest persists in Turkey and as the government tries to stamp it out with mass arrests and so on and still cannot resolve the problem, that eventually they may turn to this diversion uh, of, a, of a Turkish invasion of Syria. Russia doesn't seem prepared to allow such a thing. I mean, it would surely include, Russia would get involved very quickly. Would that be a, a correct analysis? It is not Russia to permit or to prohibit. It is rather Barack Obama. And I sense that it is because of Obama that the Turkish invasion has not as yet taken place. That there must be some kind of a modus vivendi between Obama and Erdogan, that the time is not yet right, the stakes are too high, and this is why a Turkish invasion has not taken place as yet. But that is not what the Zionists want. What the Zionists want is a Turkish invasion of Syria which will provoke Iran and provoke Russia to respond. I don't think it's possible that Turkey can invade Syria without a significant response from Iran and from Russia. And this is precisely what the Zionists want. They want to provoke a great war. A great war which will put the two major power blocks in the world in confrontation with each other, with the hope that they will mutually destroy each other. And so when all the pieces are scattered all over the world, the in arising out of that debris, Israel will emerge, emerge as the new ruling power in the world. The psychology of the Turkish people is quite amazing. They seem quite fierce in their resilience towards the regime, towards the government. I mean, they're a volatile people. I mean, in Britain, if we had such uh, oppression by the police, I think everyone would just go home and, and give up. But the, the, the Turkish people are continuing to protest day after day, it seems. It's not on one side of the fence that you find that resilience and that stubborn um, uh, attitude of keeping the fires going. It's also on the other side. And that is that the supporters of the regime are equally obstinate and stubborn and resilient. And that both sides therefore are showing backbone. If both sides are immovable, if both sides are unyielding, and if the social media keeps the fires burning long enough, then you have the recipe for civil war. Exactly the same thing is happening in Egypt. It's a repetition of Egypt.
in Turkey. The same thing. Egypt is heading for civil war. And Turkey is heading for civil war. In the case of Turkey, however, a civil war in Turkey is going to immediately attract external intervention, not from government so much as from people. Because there'll be large numbers of people who are opposed to NATO, opposed to the West, who are going to join the Turkish civil war and seek to utilize that opportunity to free Turkey from NATO membership. So Turkey will not be a NATO state, member state. But we did, we covered this subject months ago, you and I, when we called that the Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, prophesied that a Muslim army uh, is going to conquer Constantinople in the end time. This is a part of Islamic eschatology. Um, in order for a Muslim army to conquer Constantinople, you need a Turkish civil war. And that is what we will get if Turkey attacks Syria, invades Syria. This is, the, this is the first fruit of the analysis that we get when we look at what is happening in Turkey. It seems extraordinary to me that Erdogan is so um, aggressive. I mean, he's doing nothing to show compromise or, at all with the people. Is that correct? It's perhaps due to the personality of the man. But both the Turkish government or the ruling party in Turkey and the ruling party in Egypt have acted the same way. Both sides have been unyielding. They would give an inch or two here or there, but basic position is unyielding. The, the situation in Egypt now is one of uh, continued confrontation. And I think there are demonstrations which are carded for the end of June in Egypt, which again is going to bring Egypt into front center stage in the world. Uh, exactly the same situation in Turkey, except that Morsi in Egypt seems to have a grandfather image about him, <laughs> whereas Erdogan seems to have a warrior image about him. But the positions of the two ruling parties are the same. They won't even. Do you see that Morsi's uh, recent statement of cutting ties with Syria, do you see it as just a, a psychological warfare or a, a serious attempt to destroy Syria? He has to pay back. There's a paymaster <laughs> who puts him there. There's a paymaster who put Ikhwan in government in Egypt. They made that deal a few years ago with Washington. And now it's payback time. So there's a script being written for him. And he has to act in accordance with that script. And that script required of him to do what he did in cutting off ties with Syria. One would have expected uh, a prompt response from Iran. Okay, you cut off ties with Syria. It means you're waging war on Syria. And we therefore re recall our ambassador from Egypt. I Iran and Egypt have hardly had any diplomatic relations for a long time, but they're still, they're now budding and re-emerging. Re uh, the same response from Russia, um, because Russia is very heavily involved at the high stakes level in what is happening in Syria, a tit for tat. But the Russians are playing the game with some caution. As soon as the Libyan regime was overthrown, even though Russia had been deceived, and even though China had been deceived and taken for a ride, they immediately responded by rec extending diplomatic rec recognition to the new government in Libya. So they seem to have a kind of a uh, diplomatic philosophy <laughs> that uh, 
Re uh, recognition doesn't really mean much, but it does. There is some integrity that they should be showing. Um, so Mursi was actually dancing to their tune when he cut off diplomatic ties with Syria. 